In the summer of 1939, a team of co-breakers arrived at this exact place here in Buckinghamshire called Bletchley Park. It was the government code and cipher school throughout World War II, with over 10,000 men and women working here, including famous mathematicians Alan Turing and Gordon Welchman. The people recruited to work here came from a variety of backgrounds, from mathematicians, experienced code breakers, to crossword experts, international chess players, and even astrologers. They were often referred to as the Bletchley Park Boffins, working in total secrecy with a common mission, to crack the German military and intelligence communications generated by the Enigma cipher machines. These messages contained vital information about the German battle plans and the positions of their U-boats. The U-boats were the most destructive weapons in the Battle of the Atlantic. The co-breakers here used mathematics and logical thinking to decipher the Enigma messages. An electromechanical machine called a bomb was used to determine the Enigma cipher settings for the day. These settings were the key in enabling the co-breakers to crack the supposedly unbreakable Enigma coded messages. Britain's knowledge of the information contained in these messages helped shorten the war by about two whole years and save countless lives. By the end of the war, everyone working here had left and all evidence of their co-breaking exploits had been destroyed. However, the secret that they had cracked the Enigma code in messages still remained a secret. And not a single person working here disclosed this information until 30 years after the war. They were described by the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill as the geese that lay the golden eggs but never cackled. Among the most famous of the leading co-breakers, here at Bletchley Park was a mathematician from the University of Cambridge. This statue of Alan Turing is permanently housed here at Bletchley Park. Commissioned by Sidney E. Frank, sculptor Mr. Stephen Kettle worked for 18 months and used half a million pieces of slate to build this statue to commemorate the vital role Alan Turing played in breaking the Enigma cipher messages throughout World War II. At just 26 years of age, Alan Turing was regarded as a mathematical genius and he became head of the Naval Enigma team in Hut 8. Building upon cryptanalysis work by Poland before the war and with the help of Gordon Welchman, Turing constructed the bomb a device used to determine the daily setting of the Enigma cipher machine. Knowing the setting of the Enigma machine enabled Britain to read all the secret encrypted messages sent by Germany during the war. In order to preserve British security, the breaking of Enigma remained a tightly guarded secret. As a result, many of the Second World War co-breakers like Alan Turing didn't receive the public recognition they deserved. Tragically, Turing committed suicide before he was ever publicly recognised for his extraordinary part and before his contributions to the science of codes and code-breaking were fully understood. In 1939, mathematicians Alan Turing and Gordon Welchman conceived an electromechanical machine based upon the design devised by the Poles. Supposedly named after an ice cream dessert that was eaten at the time, they called this machine a bomb. The bomb weighed one tonne and determined the Enigma cipher machine's daily settings, enabling the co-breakers to read the German encrypted messages during World War II. Members of the Women's Royal Navy Service, shortened to RENS, operated the bomb machines. The bomb relied on the knowledge of cribs, which were words in a message the co-breakers were able to guess. For example, the word Wetter, German for weather. 
which was contained in the weather report messages sent daily. These cribs were essential for breaking the Enigma cipher. Without a crib, it would still take several months today to decipher an A4 page of ciphertext using a modern computer with trial and error methods. Just over 200 of these bombs were engineered during the war. They were engineered by the British Tabulating Machine Company in Hertfordshire. In 1940, the first bomb machine was in operation. However, all were destroyed after the war. Thanks to, a, to 12 years of dedicated work by a team of enthusiasts, 62 years after the war, we now have a working rebuilt version of a noisy bomb machine. Now this is John Harper, who led the team in the rebuild project of the bomb. Now tell me John, how did you actually rebuild the bomb machine, considering um, all were actually destroyed after the war? Yes, the machines were destroyed, but fortunately um, GCH Kilt Shelterman sent back the set of parts drawings that related to all the um, versions of this bomb, not just this, this particular model that we've rebuilt. Um, from those we were able to extract information. We had no assembly drawings, that was one of the problems. Um, those were created by, um, with the help of um, veterans, people that actually worked on the machines, either as maintenance engineers or designers or um, manufacturers. And they helped us work our way through these drawings and some photographs that we got back from the American National Archive. Um, the Americans recorded more than we did in the, at that time. Piecing all that lot together, uh, we managed to redraw the whole thing on a modern design automation package and um, we assembled the whole machine on paper before we started on it and then we knew more or less that everything would fit and everything would go together. Now there were about a hundred thousand million 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 possible settings for the Enigma machine for, for any one day. How did the bomb actually find out that one particular setting for each day during the war? Um, what was most important was that the wheel order, and the wheel order is the order in which the um, wheels were put into the original Enigma machine. These are equivalent to the same. The, 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 virtually, the wiring inside there is the same as the German Enigma wheels. They would have five, we got five different colours, and these were put in, had to be in exactly the right order, there was no chance of getting the stop at all. Fortunately, uh, the Germans were not up to um, total random number. They put all sorts of rules on things like the, the wheels that went in a position yesterday can't go in the same position today. Now that's not random, that starts to put rules. Yeah. And if you apply all those rules that they'd, they'd applied and a bit more uh, knowledge that the British had picked up by experience, you could get it down to about six combinations of wheels. Therefore a machine like this can have three different wheel orders on it and therefore two machines have a high probability of finding the right answer. Or, if it wasn't quite so important, you'd do it on one machine, and if that didn't work, you'd take all this lot off, put them all back in a different order, and try again. But they were usually successful, with a re relatively large, a small number. And then it was 26, times 26, times 26 tests across all of them. And somewhere in there, hopefully these drums were in the right position to satisfy the menu that you said earlier on. And if it did, the machine stops, and then you get the indication on these drums that back at the end here. Now at the height of the war, 4,000 German encrypted Enigma messages were read daily as a result of the bomb machines. They provided the essential information needed by the British Army, Navy and Air Force to rise to victory, therefore changing the course of history.